Welcome to the Writer's Dream. Our show is a forum for authors where they can talk about how they write their books, how they publish their books, and how they market their books. We are on YouTube, YouTube and we are on Facebook. If you go on our Facebook page, which is called The Writer's Dream, please like us and ask any questions that uh, come to mind. Uh, we do try to answer them. Uh, on YouTube, again, search The Writer's Dream, and you can see all of our interviews. We ha we're into our third year now, or we're completing our third year, and uh, we've interviewed about 80 authors, different genre, very exciting, very interesting. Um, we are also... Uh, available for viewing on Cablevision, uh, all three Cablevision on, uh, stations on Long Island and the one in Westchester. So uh, consult your program guide to see when they are on. Today's guest is Roland Alnock. Roland is the author of Oddities and Entities and Remnants. He is also the winner of uh, 50 Great Authors You Should Be Reading from the Author Show and from the Pacific Book Club. Pacific Book Reviews, Book Awards. Pacific yeah. Book Reviews. Welcome, Roland. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Tell us about your books. Well, I've been writing in a number of different genres. And with my first book, Remnant, I sort of bridged between uh, science fiction and speculative writing. And for my second book, I went a little bit different direction and tried my hand at some horror, supernatural, paranormal. But really, they are just um, deconstructions of human problems. <laughs> uh, I, I like to write character-based, and um, I think those things kind of unify the, the stories through their, their genres, humanize them. So um, what's the inspiration for, for your plots? First of all, can you, can you give us one of your favorite stories from, since Oddities and Entities is your um, most recent, can you yes. give us like a, a little a summary of the favorite story, or any story from yes. that book? Uh, there's one particular story in there called Elmer Phelps, which uh, follows a brother and a sister. They, they get bit by a bat in their youth. And little do they realize, as time goes by, they've been changed by this. And not to give too much away, uh, the sister goes one way, Elmer tries to go the other way. And when she comes back into his life, he now has to reckon a very strange change in the way he perceives existence. And he finds her hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, it's, uh, I guess, a little bit of a vampire type thing. Where, again, Vampires are very popular away. now. Yes, but I it's have not my favorites. an outright, you know, running around, <laughs> drawing right. blood from people. Right. Uh, it's more of feeding off other people's souls, almost, harvesting their memories and using that for power. So really what she's involved in is, is sort of a nefarious type of existence. And uh, as much as she learns of the, the greater things that go on to create people as people, she's a predator on that. She uses that for power. Uh, Elmer being sort of the younger brother, he's, he's weak, he's kind of a social outcast. He starts to see this as fulfilling a lot of the questions he has as to why his life has been the way it is. And he starts to see it not as something just to manipulate and predate, but something to justify what he's done and sort of fill the gaps in his head as to you know, what, what he really wants to find in life. And uh, th these two things, of course, can't really exist happily together. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a bit of a collision there. But towards the end of the story, he's trying to, to figure everything out and make his reestablish his morality. And after the things that happen, and there's a little philosophical thought he realizes that, and it, to paraphrase uh, the line, the human mind for all its three pounds is eternal. There's eternity in your head. And he realizes as long as he embraces that, that philosophy can help him bridge through all these crazy things he's experienced. And I think it's, it's a nice way to encapsulate a lot of what goes on in the book, because really what I try to do is take people throw them a curveball from outside our, our standard perception of existence. And now, you know, the work of allegory. You're pushed outside your comfort zone. You now look back on what you perceived as reality, what you perceived as your moral standards, and realize maybe it's not quite that way. And now you have to readjust. And you learn through that. Well, I was reading um, some summaries on your website of these stories. and. Um, one of the analogies you came up with that I thought was really great was the inspiration you got walking through a parking lot yes. 
Describe that. Uh, that was for one of the stories in there called My Other Me. And uh, again, it was sort of the idea of splitting away from what you commonly perceive as yourself. And uh, I was walking out of a, a Long Island Ducks game <laughs> and uh, going across the parking lot. And it was dark. They have the big lights there. And as I was walking, I was looking down. And between the different lights, there were four shadows of myself. And as I went from light to light, they kind of turned and blurred and fed into each other. And I just thought, you know, you walk around and you have a certain image of yourself. You know, a lot of what you may perceive of the world may have to do with how you perceive yourself, right? reflections. But I looked at those shadows and I thought, what if those shadows had a conscience? Suppose that was the way you perceived yourself and you really didn't have a concrete form. If you are freed of you know, that you're a concrete form, you're going to have this elasticity to your awareness. Perhaps you're going to think of things you wouldn't normally think of. Perhaps you'll, you'll perceive things you couldn't normally perceive because you've been liberated in a certain degree. And uh, the more I thought of that, the more the story started to come together. And I thought, well, this is really getting weird. But <laughs> it's also philosophical. And that's really what I like to do with my writing is not bludgeon people with philosophy, but just to make you think. And, take you out of, again, your norm and say, hmm, all right, didn't think of that. But you know, science is giving you a bit of uh, background on that yes. because we're finding that we are really not exactly as we are perceived right. in one reality, that this is one reality. Right. If you key into string theory where yes. everything's vibrating at, its, at different frequencies, who knows how many of us there are. Right, and if you <laughs> dig down into quantum mechanics, string theory, the further down you go to the fundamentals, the stranger things become. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, they have found, you know, you can have a particle here, you hit it with an electric field, now it's over there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things going on uh, that, that we really haven't figured out. But certainly, one thing that's been discovered is that reality is far stranger than we perceive it to be. This world that we know, sight, sound, touch, feel, is, is really kind of, it's real, but it is sort of an illusion because we're only seeing this segment of reality, and then there's all of that underneath And also, it. I'm seeing something different from what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably some commonality. At least yes. I hope there is. <laughs> yeah. Well, there I is especially hope that when I'm driving, right. <laughs> there's some commonality of perception amongst yeah, well, all of us. A stop sign is an absolute. The police will certainly tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but th there's an absolute common ground that we share, but how you interpret that is entirely your own. Mm -hmm. So things that we perceive as other people's judgment, judgments, their mental health, these are all relativistic. And our brains and are different. Exactly. I mean, we're finally coming to the notion that our brains are actually different. We are the, um, we are the result of uh, the chemical combinations yeah. in our brains, our behavior is, and uh, yeah. um, in a way, it's a little scary. Yeah. So, but you speak of philosophy. Do you have a background in philosophy? Is that no, what you actually, my, my background is science and technical. Oh, I work in go. a hospital lab, so hey, you can relate to some of that. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think science, when you really dig into science, science is really curiosity. You're looking at the world around you. You're trying to figure out what it is. And you know, certainly in my professional capacity, that, that's limited because you're at a job. But, uh, I always had a curiosity as to how things work. Mm -hmm. When I was a little kid, I took my <laughs> toys so apart, funny. wanted to figure them out. Yep. And I remember sticking my finger in a socket one time just to see what that electric <laughs> jolt felt like. <laughs> Not the brightest idea, but you know, I was always trying to figure there's, there's some kind of process to things. And if you question enough, you know, the famous thing, why? Why, 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 why? And every time you answer one of those questions, it opens up another door. Mm -hmm. And that kind of creative freedom, I feel like that, that just pays Endless, endless dividends. You can follow it as long as you want to go. Yeah, I get into a lot of arguments with, with not arguments, but discussions with friends about um, about science because there's such a um, a poor perception of science yes. in our society, which I find enormously ironic simply because our entire economy is based on technology, which is based on science, but people True. don't like science. Yeah. And I try to explain <laughs> this to them that science is a process. It has no likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. It is a process to find the truth. In fact, modern day scientists are, are philosophers. Yes. Aristotle and Plato, Plato were, were yeah. the philosophers of the past. So, um, but that's a really good place to come from. I think, and, and I think that enables you to have the open-mindedness right. to come up with these, these ideas, which is one of my questions is what inspires you to write? And I think you 
pretty much touched on it. Where do yes. your characters come from? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, for me, the, the, all the stories start with characters. Everything I write starts with the character. And, uh, you know, the dedication on my second book was to all the little voices. And basically, those are the voices in my head. <laughs> and, um, and not, not to make light of people who, who really have issues with voices, <laughs> voices in, their in their heads. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, more from the creative aspect. I like, and when I was young, you know, I, I would always think, you know, what about if my personality was this or my personality was that? And then, you know, getting a, a little more mature, gaining on in years, you, know, you gain a little bit of life wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, what if a person was this way? Or what if a person was that way? And it's, it's almost like, building an algorithm in my head, you know, and mm -hmm. personalities obviously are more complex, but if you can get in touch with your own ideas of what you want from life, what your goals are, where your emotional center may sit, it's not a big leap to extrapolate to a fictional character. Once you have that in mind, whatever setting or plot you want to put them in, it will almost write itself, because that character is going to respond to things based on their personality, just as we as real people respond to things based on yeah. our personality. And I think that also allows, as you go through a story, as you develop a story, hindsight. You know, hindsight, I think, is very important in life, because what do you always do? You look back on the things you did, and you start to draw causal connections. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I did that because I was thinking this at the time, and I don't see any reason why fictional characters couldn't be that way either. And if you take them and put them in strange circumstances, so real situations, they may make conclusions that are kind of out of the blue. And again, it opens another door. Why did they do that? Well, a behavior, a challenge. right? Yes. And it's this whole business of does your plot drive your character or does your character drive your plot? And, uh, and it's the different things that they do that, that make yeah. the story interesting. Yeah. And, I feel and characters what they should do with that. Plot. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think that's. Uh, now, is there a, a, a theme that goes through all of your stories, like uh, the good guys always win? And I don't, I, I don't no. mean that as, <laughs> as what your theme is, but yeah. as an example of, you know, the good guys always lose, or is there a theme? No. Uh, one of the things I like to do is, is challenge the notion of what we may consider good or bad, even winning or losing. Um, morality, again, there are absolutes of morality, but morality has a large subjective gray zone. And one of the things I tried to do with, with both books is put characters in situations where the absolutes don't really work for them anymore. Something so weird has happened, something has pushed them so far out from the norm that you know, maybe they have to reconsider the way they thought of things. That moral question helps drive the story because at some point, whatever happens in your life as a real person, you, you have to find your, your center again. These people are all trying to reestablish that center. And Part of the fun with the stories is what they do to establish that center. We may consider outlandish, we may consider repulsive, but to them, it starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. you know, it you works. You do what your situation demands right. of you. You adapt. Right. And I think that's a fundamentally human thing. That's probably some of the most fascinating stories in our, in our society are the stories about people who are put into situations where yes. um, they have to do something that is so repugnant to us yes. to survive. Well, I think that's also a, a, a timeless factor in literature in general. I mean, if you look at the things we've kept as our human tradition in literature, you know, why do we keep Homer? Why do we keep Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. well, these things, even though they're specific to their time and place, they say something about us as people that transcends time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that speaks to something about the human character that will always be with us, whether it's a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now those questions will always be there. People will always question their surroundings and will always try to make sense of it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. That's true. Do you mind if I read from your... Please do. You have a hindsight view of oddities and entities, and uh, obviously you wrote this. The stories cover some varied ground, from the lazy summer evenings of Florida in Boneview to the frigid northern territory of Elmer Phelps to the Pacific shores in Gray to a nightmarish morgue in shift change to a college campus in My Other Me, and last to an exotic jungle and globe-hopping memories of appendage. The wide scope of settings was done by design. I at once wanted to portray experiences in the world that were somewhat different in some of the philosophical interactions of the characters of the distinct stories 
and yet present a cohesive message that no matter the locale, otherworldly phenomenon are right around the corner. This also drove the unifying summary scope of global settings reflected in appendage. Yes. So you sum that up really, <laughs> really nicely. And um, I'm very intrigued by this because um, most of paranormal science fiction um, is, is violence-based. You know, if there's a lot of uh, slash and bash going on um, to attract attention. And I, I like this because you really are um, concentrating on that um, psychological aspect of... Yeah, and again, uh, you know, we are... <laughs> both creatures of our environment and we shape our environment. So, you know, for reading from the what I wrote on my website, uh, you know, I wanted to create the idea that this universality, we can be in all different places, but again, the, there's a certain part of us that is always there, mm -hmm. is common. Mm -hmm. And the settings, I, I bounced around to, to try to show that you can be here, you can be there, but when strange things start to happen, there are certain standards, you know, common to us. And uh, the setting is to at once show there's a range of places you can go, but yet there is, again, that commonality that you, you have to come back to at some point. And that, that is that idea of a moral center, a philosophical center, where you, you try to reckon the world. And that's also very... That is also the product of a scientifically trained mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I think analysis. You know, um, yeah. yeah. As as a scientific mind, you look at the world and you try to deconstruct it to its processes. Uh, with these mm -hmm. characters, you know, as much as I have a scientific background, uh, none of these characters really do, and that was by design because I thought part of the fun of the stories was them trying to learn that okay, there's a process, there's, there's something going on here that I need to figure out and then adjust to. You know, I think to a great extent we live our life in a zone of complacency. You know, we expect certain things. We expect to go to work and you know, go home and, and there's a certain security there. And that's what I always like to jar. There, there are things in my life that I, I'm, are, you know, like anybody, that are near and dear to me. My family, you know, these are things I love. And one of the things I like to do with my stories is to imagine, well, if this is so important to me, what if I had a character who had that and now it's taken away from mm -hmm. them? How would they respond? Mm -hmm. you know, and part of that comes from how would I respond? <laughs> well, that, you know, that also, that's life. I mean, we are, as you say, very complacent and everything's yes. very predictable. Yes. And uh, the things that happen to us that are unpredictable are, first of all, frightening. Yes. Um, very rarely ever looked at as opportunities. Right. But the way you deal with them, yeah. uh, especially if you see them as opportunities, change, can change your life. And you look back and you say, gee, I'm glad that happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like to do a little shift change now. Okay. How did you get into writing? I started, I, well, I wrote my first short story when I was 16 years old. And I grew up, my, my brother, my friends and I, we used to play role-playing games. That's where it kind of started. And, you know, with a role-playing game, we'd have to write these little adventures to guide players' characters. And that was something I really enjoyed. And you know, as I went through writing these things, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice just to you know, take that and just write it beginning to end and really control it? Plus, at the same time, I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And I found I was always kind of critiquing, not criticizing, but critiquing the structure mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. And already thinking to myself, if I wrote this, where would I go? Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I would love when I would read is falling asleep while I was reading something. Because if it's